Okay, so it may seem a little strange how we're approaching this, but because this is a paint job that is replicating what the previous race car looked like, it's also representing uh, the paint scheme that was on an original GTA quite some time ago. So we're not painting the whole thing simply because I am doing this in three stages. Half white and single stage. Tomorrow I'll take off that half, and then this half is going to be red. And then pull up the tape and clear coat the whole thing tomorrow. Okay, so now that we've had greeny out all summer long and did some thorough shakedowns on a car that hasn't been on the road since the mid-70s, um, there's a few little bugs and quirks that we still need to work out. One of the things we never really fully solved, but we did improve, was the whistling sound that is coming from somewhere in the intake system on the car. Um, we could never find an actual leak, um, but when we did tear it apart and put it back together, it did improve quite a bit, but it's still there and we need to do something about it. Some of the things we're going to be accomplishing on Greeny over this winter is we're going to do a lot of winter testing. We have our single piece carbon fiber drive shafts that uh, will be coming in any day now. And this car is going to get fitted with it and we're going to do a full shakedown on that, that system so we know exactly how to offer that to people. Um, the other things we're going to be doing is, is we switched over to... A, just a filter sock style carburation intake on this, but I still like the look of the original cross flow uh, canister setup. I'm going to try to find a better way to improve that. Now, we did modify our original canister intake for uh, 45s, which is what's on this car, but I would like to try to find a more direct fresh flow air design, which, you know, we may just mod the box. I don't know yet. Um, so there's just a few things we're doing there. Other things we're going to do is we're actually going to bite your lip we're going to put in a completely hidden stereo system. It's going to run strictly off of your phone. 
Um, one thing about Greeny, although it is a side exhaust car, it is a fairly quiet car, especially with these vintage polyglass tires. It doesn't make a whole lot of noise going down the road, which is a good thing. It's a good free-flowing exhaust, but yet it doesn't sound like a dragster when it's going down the road with this particular uh, header and exhaust on it. So we're going to actually put the music in. More so of a request from my wife, because though she loves going for rides, she doesn't necessarily want to listen to engines the entire time. So we're going to put in the sound system for that, and again, other than the speakers, everything else is going to be fairly well hidden. Um, so we'll, we'll see what we're doing with that. Though I'm not a guy who's really big on aesthetics, there are things that I think just look right about a car. One thing I've never liked is when people use their oil vapor uh, reclaim system and they stuff it into like a, a soda can or a beer can. God, that looks tacky to me. Um, and I didn't want the massive mogul system either because quite honestly, this thing doesn't blow by a whole lot of oil vapor that needs to be trapped. So what we did was, is we have these two can systems. These are just little pint canton systems. They're fairly inexpensive compared to all the other things out there you can buy. This one is just for the, uh, the water trapping for the overflow. So it's a simple enough system and it works great. So I bought another one for the oil vapor trapping. And then what is unique about this is you can't see it, but on the back side, I drilled a series of holes because the amount of air vapor that's coming out of this is pretty stout. So you need to be able to allow that air to escape without pressurizing because that'll cause head gasket issues, you know, all sorts of oil seal issues. So you don't want all that. So this is still very free flowing. It's going into this canister. So I drilled a series of holes on the back side. Then I took fibrous materials, you know, kind of like um, your scotch brights and stuff like that. I took a fibrous material that doesn't break down when petroleum touches it, and I packed it to the inside of this through the hole in the bottom. So, my oil vapor pressurization system is oil vapor comes in here, it's non restricted, so it's able to flow out the back, but all the oil that would be in that air vapor system is trapped by the fibrous material that's stuck in there. This works pretty clean. I like it because it looks fairly simple. More importantly, it looks like it almost belongs in the car. Certainly much better than using bicycle water bottles and, you know, Red Bull cans and everything else I've seen people stuff in here. Why cheapen something that's so horribly expensive? So it's a nice, big, quiet Saturday. I don't have any disruptions here. So the big thing we're tackling today is, is that we're going to solve that squeaking sound for the final time. Um, the person who develops all our uh, top end work on our 155, 75 and performance motors uh, was here with a guest a couple weeks ago and he kind of came up with a very clever idea of how to source where the sound was coming from. So what he did, took a hose and like a doctor uses a stethoscope, he placed it in key locations around the intake to solve where the squeaking sound was coming from. And he concluded that it was coming off of the number three uh, intake port somewhere. We don't feel that it's anything related to the head, which is good because I really didn't want to pull the head off this motor. Um, but it's certainly something to do with the relationship with the carburetor to the rubber mounts to the intake, from the intake to the head. So, unfortunately, uh, we're going to start tearing it apart and keep listening for the sound. If you forgot what that sound sounded like, listen. Did you hear that? That squeak, squeak, squeak? Once again. If you really think about that, everybody has always thought that that was a belt, and I knew it wasn't a belt because it's our serpentine belt system and it's never made a noise. But if you listen to it, it's on a specific stroke of one of the cylinders. And you can hear it, and it goes away when the throttles are wide open. So, it's something to do with the air intake on the, uh, on the system. So, we're going to start reversing this. We're going to take away the carburetors, see if the sound is there. Take away the isolator mounts, see if the sound is there. I hope I don't have to take the intake itself off because we all know how much of a mess that is. Okay, so you're looking at my exceptionally high-tech way of trying to solve for where my air leak is. You notice I have tape over number one. I've already done this, so I already know where it's at, but I wanted to show you where it was at. So the tape's over number one, I'm gonna crank the motor. As you can tell, there's absolutely no sound coming from a squeak. 
However, when I move this to number two, just like last time, I must have missed something when we tore this apart last time. Now tapes over number two. And pay close attention. You heard our squeak. So obviously I do have an air leak that is specific to the boot to here or from here to the actual intake on the head. Unfortunately, from this point forward, I have to drain fluid in order to get past this point because all the water jackets that are involved in this. And that's, that's kind of sad because it's always a mess. If I had to be really honest, I have to admit that I really dislike the fact that I have to do this. Mostly because I have to admit that I've already been here, already thought I had this whipped, and I did something wrong. Nobody in the right mind should be very happy about that. I guess the only thing I had to be thankful for, at least it's my own car, not a customer. All right, take the uh, front hose off, and at that point, it's ready to start unbolting the intake. Last I was here several months ago, I failed to do one thing I should have done. I didn't separate the rubber uh, uh, carb mounts from the actual intake, so odds are my problem is there. But I kind of wanted to show you something, seeing how we're here anyway, much as I don't want to be here. And that is this. A few months ago, if you ordered an intake to head gasket, you got this. It was a you know the traditional tar-based paper setup. Now, you get this. This is just like our graphite impregnated stainless steel uh, ones that we make for the exhaust. Somebody is now producing these, and that is really a nice setup. So I'm happy to see those. The only downside of this is if you've got any places where it's not clean to the pore, you might want to you know, be careful and file some of that away so you don't have any disruption of airflow and fuel mixture coming into the head. But other than that, and this one doesn't seem to have much of a problem. Other than that, it's a really nice setup. So I'm here and now I'm going to get rid of the residual from the old gasket. All the stuff right here you see is a tar based uh, sealant that we use. I don't like to use silicone no matter what on aluminum. But this right here never really hardens and it doesn't move. It stays right where it is. So I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to using this. It's really good for creating the seals on gaskets. Again, if you can, try to stay away from the silicone based uh, sealants on aluminum car parts. Okay, I'm taking off the number one just simply so I have something to compare when I take off the number two intake. Now, for all accounts and purposes, uh, this is fairly normal. You see a little heating around the barreling here. That just means during the tuning process, you probably had some hot gases popping back through and it starts to heat up the, uh, the gasket a little bit. But there's no perforation in the gasket and it's still tight against the boot. The boot has absolutely no tears, and well, they're brand new and they better not. Now let's go to the one that we, I'm hoping is the problem, because if it isn't this, it means it's in the head, and if it's in the head, I'll be a little upset. Oh, well, looky there, I found my problem. <laughs> 
the gasket is completely blown apart here and here. Let's compare that to this one. Do you see how this is clean against the walls and this is completely eroded away? So that's my problem. That's where the whistling was coming from. That's really good news because the alternative is something I wasn't looking forward to. For the life of me, I did not want to tear the head off my car. Not that I'm opposed to it, just going back in there after building it, nobody wants to do that. All right, so as you can see, it's blown out here and here. That means air is escaping underneath here, or I should say sucking in, and that's where the problems come from. Now obviously you don't dare replace just one, we're gonna replace all four, and I'll let you know if I run into any more problems. That's great news. Okay, so I came in on Saturday and I did all the modifications and improvements and repairs on the, uh, the intake and let the uh, the gasket system set up over the weekend, Saturday or Friday. Weekend. Here we are Monday morning, fired right up, and as you can tell, there is not a chirp in it. I think we finally got this one quick. One thing about doing the wiring on these cars, if you're going to use a schematic, make sure you're using a schematic that is specific to your car. 
And note this, there is a difference between European and American destination cars. This was a German market car, so this, the standard wiring diagrams we find, works for this car just well. It was an American destination car, we had a few changes that they didn't have in some of the European market cars. For example, we had hazard lights, which is a really convoluted wiring addition that's not on here. It can really mess with you if you're trying to sort through the wiring in your car. Um, a few other things you need to be advised on, but they're trivial. Uh, sometimes there's a fuel pump that's electrical, sometimes it's mechanical. Just some little things like that. So just recognize that you may have the, white, the right diagram for the car, but there may be some subtle changes to it. There's even sometimes we run into color changes in the wiring that wasn't on the diagram. So don't see this as the absolute accurate thing, um, but it is certainly a good reference to help you get through the wiring challenges on these cars. As always, excuse the noise. Here's where we're at. We're putting the race car wiring system back together. It's kind of a two-edged sword. We don't want to remove a bunch of wiring that may inevitably be repurposed if the car ever returns to street life. But at the same time, we have to repair any insulation degradation that's going on. Fancy terminology for wiring that is uh, hardened or started to melt away from the actual wires itself. So we're making those repairs. As long as we're going across it, we're also wiring up the gauges and everything else involved in this car. Wiring is a is a daunting task. <laughs> We've done it enough times that I can almost do it in my sleep. But the reality of it is, is this is an excellent opportunity for you to improve the wiring in your car if you're doing this. Don't upsize wires if you can't justify why you're doing it. What do I mean by that? The wire selected in a harness is meant specifically for a certain size amperage that is expected to carry. If you start putting larger amperage wire in or undersized amperage wire in, you're starting to change the characteristics of how things are going to work. Maybe that's a little over the top. That's for you to decide. But the point is, just about everything on the gauge is a very low amperage consumption. So just about everything under here is going to be 16 gauge wire. The larger the number, the smaller the wire. And inverse of that, the smaller the number, the larger the gauge wire. So anyhow, I'm going into the final phases of putting this stuff together, and I'll be just about done. A few things to know. A lot of people like to try to preserve that Corella flasher unit that's under here. If they're working, great. If not, not a big deal. Your local hardware or local parts store carries an exact drop-in. It would be a 550 model flasher relay. The size of the relay is relevant to the amount of amperage you expected to carry. That's what makes it flash. If you have heavier wattage bulb than what is designed for that flasher, it'll either not flash at all, or if it's undersized, it'll flash too much. So you want to make sure you're getting the right size flasher for the job. For these alphas, a 550 is ideal. Again, excuse all the noises, we're working, is what we have to do. Anyway, so the, the heater box is no longer in this car. It's a race car, it doesn't need it. The rest of this wiring has been completely cleaned, everything has been checked, a lot of repairs have been made to improve the quality of the connection. Never underscore that. If you think that your uh, connectors are weak, you should always replace them. And if you replace them, try to go the extra mile, put some heat shrink around them to reduce the stress on the terminal and the wiring going in the terminal. Those little things like that, as you see right here, go a long way for the longevity of the electrical system in these cars. Right now, I'm in the final phases. What I'm doing is I'm finishing up the relay to flasher system. In other words, the turn signal stock to its terminal point, which is this right here, that goes out to the lights. Because this car is technically dual purpose, it will be on the streets, although it's not really going to be a street car, all the lighting needs to work. So again, we're almost done with this. And then the car goes into the final phasing, which means, you know, uh, the trim goes on, the windows go in, and then the motor and transmission get fitted, and then it's at that end point. 
but do yourself a favor. If you have to redo the wire to your car, take the additional half an hour, 45 minutes it takes to get the seats out. There's no reason for you to negotiate around the seats to try to do the electrical. The more comfortable you are, the more likely you are to do it right.